Thanks, everyone. These lights are really bright, so I can't actually see any of you. <laughs> but I know you're here. Um, I know I'm in between you and coffee, so I'll, I'll keep it upbeat. I'll keep it quick, hopefully. Um, and and uh, let's see how things are going. I'm going to... We've heard a lot about AI this morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI as well. AI supposedly thinks that we're going to have three legs. I can't see if you can see that, but this is an image created by uh, Midjourney, an AI bot um, that thinks that this is the future of hotel check-ins. Um, um, and supposedly people will have three legs by then. But um, um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk not just about AI, I'm going to talk more broadly about travel, um, travel distribution and how that's going to change. And, and obviously technology is a big part, but there are some other trends as well that we'll touch on. And I want to start positive, like I said, upbeat. I think, and we at Skift and at Skift Research think that this is the most important time to be creative in travel. Uh, travel is more important today than it's ever been probably. People during the pandemic have realized how important travel is, um, not just to our economies, but to personal fulfillment, for work, for leisure, for pleasure, for everything. And so um, things have been going very well over the past years. I'm sure you've found that as well here um, um, in Mallorca or, or in Spain or wherever you're from. But things are starting to get a little bit tougher. So it is time to be creative. And why is it time to be creative? Um, like I said, pent-up demand is over. So this revenge travel that we've been talking about and this, these savings that people have had during the pandemic are pretty much dried up now. So we need to start thinking again about, okay, how are we going to get consumers to visit our destinations or our hotels? The future of work is being reinvented. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So how people are working is changing, and therefore how people are traveling is changing. Um, global flows of travelers are changing. Again, I'll talk about this, but um, we're obviously seeing Asia reopening, and that's having a big impact on where people travel and how they travel. Uh, the renaissance of big investments in travel, um, finally, people are starting to invest in travel again, and actually there's a lot of money out there. Um, investors are still a little bit scared to, to put money on the table, but it's coming. It's coming, right? They're looking for deals. So if you are a business that's looking for a deal, this is the time, but you need to provide something that's special. And finally, generative AI could change everything. So let's, let's talk about this in three broad steps. So first of all, I want to talk about how, the new, how a new global order is reshaping travel. Um, I want to talk about the travel booking experience and then the actual in-destination experience. And so how all of these um, are changing because of some of these factors that I've mentioned. So let's start with an overview of sort of how is travel looking and what's happening um, uh, in the world? So I was here last year. It was a great event. That's why I'm back. Um, I started a lot more downbeat last year than I did this year. Um, if you were here, you might remember this slide. Um, I, I've changed a few of the words because last year we were still worried about COVID. That's probably over now. But we are worried about a recession. We're talking about extreme inflation. Climate change, you've heard it all this morning already, the Ukraine war, uh, Brexit, um, all sorts of things are happening, right, in the world. And so how do you deal with that as a travel company? If we look at what economists, be economists believe, um, Europe is actually a hotbed of, or at the epicenter of probably economic weak growth or actually a recession, um, as well as um, high inflation. So how do we deal with that? Are we going to have a recession later this year? Uh, or in 2024, and what does that mean for the travel industry? Also, when we do surveys with consumers, with travelers, we're seeing that more and more people are noticing that prices are really high for travel. And I'm sure you've all benefited from that, and it's been very good for the travel industry to get back that liquidity that was needed. But prices are high. And so people are now starting to change their behavior because of high prices. Um, and actually, Quite a few people that notice that prices are higher saying, we've changed our travel. So maybe they're going domestic instead of international. They're trying to find other ways of traveling, um, less luxury hotels, um, or actually canceling their trips. At the same time, though, we do believe that at least this year, travel will still be booming. Um, as you can see, we're expecting strong year-over-year -year growth um, for all sectors. The cruise industry especially, because they were pretty much non-existent still last year. Um, airlines also weren't performing so well last year. Um, they are all coming back. 
but also hotels and short-term rentals, which obviously performed very well last year, are still performing very well. So how do we square that circle? How does it make sense that I'm just telling you that things are going bad with the economy, but at the same time we're expecting things to be going still relatively well for travel this year? There's a few reasons for that. The first one is that travel is still under-indexed, and I'll explain what that means on the next slide. The second one is the reopening of Asia, um, which is obviously happening right now, um, and we will have to see what the impact is, um, but it is very much a big panacea for the travel industry. So when I talk about travel being under-indexed, what do we mean by that? Um, the travel industry was hit very hard during the pandemic. Um, the rest of the economy was slightly hit. Certain parts were hit. Other parts actually performed very well. And so GDP in most countries continued to grow during the pandemic. And GDP is one of the strongest correlated factors to travel. If GDP grows, travel spending grows. Now, when we look at 2019 GDP and we compare that to 2023 GDP, we can see that in a lot of regions in the world, or in most regions in the world, it's about 20 to 30% higher than it was in 2019. In travel, we've been so focused on getting back to 100% of what we had in 2019, that actually we're still behind. So we have this Skift Travel Health Index, the blue bars, where we, track, we, we have 22 data partners, TravelGateX is one of them, we track how the industry is performing. And we compare how the current performance is to 2019. And we're seeing, yes, a lot of regions are back to 100%, back to 2019 levels. But we're forgetting that actually the economy has moved on and has actually continued to grow. So really, even if the economy, even if we have a recession, and a few of those percentage points are going to drop from the economy, there's still a lot of growth left for travel because we are still behind where we were in 2019. Secondly, um, Asia is coming back. Um, we all know, of course, that China reopened at the beginning of this year. Um, it's, it's in a catch-up phase. Um, po policies are loosening, but there are some questions. So far, Chinese travelers aren't back to where they were in 2019. Are they going to come back? Do they want different things? There's still a lot of questions on the table around what's actually going to happen. But I think what is definitely happening is that how and where people travel is changing. And so regions like Latin America and Asia are the hotbeds of, of travel at the moment, as well as the Middle East. Europe, North America, used to be not so much anymore. And so there's, there's growing competition from those regions. And what do you do about that? And one last slide. This is not necessarily something that's happening now, but will happen over the coming years and decades. We're all looking at China. Let's start thinking about India. Because this year, India's population will, be, will become larger than the Chinese population. And so there's a lot of people in India that will want to travel. Um, their economy is far behind what China is today. Um, their um, travel um, um, penetration is far less, but it will come. So India will be the next China for the next coming decades, and so we have to start thinking about that. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the changing booking landscape. So we always, before the pandemic and still now, talked about this battle between direct bookings and OTAs, right? Um, and that's obviously still going on. What we saw during the pandemic was that direct bookings did very well. People didn't trust OTAs, they didn't trust the information on OTAs. They would rather call a hotel, and so hotel or um, phone bookings also were very high. Um, now we're starting to see that that is reversing. So direct bookings are declining. Not a good thing for hotels, a very good thing for intermediaries. At the same time, we're seeing that discounting is coming back. During the pandemic, people weren't really motivated to travel because you were offering them a discount. They just didn't travel at all. They weren't allowed to travel. Now, people are starting to get more interested in discounts again. And so hoteliers, airlines, they need to start offering discounts to sell their goods and their, their services. Um, and again, this is not necessarily a good thing for suppliers, who are the best at offering discounts and who are the most ruthless when it comes to discounts is obviously the intermediaries. 
So things are moving back to where they were, I would say. Now, we always talk about this um, relationship, these frenemies, suppliers versus distributors, as this tug of war, this pendulum that swings back and forth, right? Suppliers, so hotels, rentals, airlines, they've got the amenities, right? They've got the actual goods. People are staying in their hotels, people come to them, they've got that, and intermediaries will never have that. But then came online search, where the, the distributors were much stronger. And so the, the pendulum swung, the power swung more to the intermediaries. There was a bit of a fight back from the suppliers, from hoteliers. Loyalty programs became bigger, there was a lot of direct booking push, um, and so we saw some of that power moving back to the suppliers. Now we're in this stage, the data stage. And for suppliers, I should say, sadly, you're probably going to miss out on that one. You're going to lose out to the distributors. If we look at Booking.com, they sell about 900 million room nights per year. That's both hotels and short-term rentals. Expedia does about 500 million. Um, they also have, obviously, have flights, car rental, experiences, all that kind of stuff. They have so much data, and not a single hotelier, not even Marriott or Hilton, has as much data as these providers do. And one key thing that you need for AI is a lot of data and all of that to be in the cloud. And at the moment, most suppliers aren't set up for that, and OTAs are. So that is one impact that AI will definitely have. We did some research on where will the biggest impact of AI be? And we have a report on that. You can read it on our, on our website. Um, it's on generative AI, so it's not necessarily all of the AI, but just sort of the new tools that, that we're talking about this morning, uh, chatbots and, and all that stuff. The biggest impact will be on travel planning, travel inspiration. So the search, the traditional search of how do people search for a destination and where do they want to go, what do they book, that's where the biggest impact will be. The, the lower hanging fruit, where we're already seeing stuff happening, is around reputation management. So having an AI write a reply to a re review for you. Uh, support, customer support, having a chat bot. That's stuff that can already happen. Operationally, as was already mentioned this morning, um, coding. Um, if you operate a large company um, or a smaller company that needs some development work done, you can have chat GPT or another AI do a lot for that uh, for you. On GitHub, which is a coding uh, platform, I believe about 50% of all code that's written today is already done by AI. So things are moving very rapidly there. Now, we try to put a dollar value on that. So all of the stuff that you saw on this slide, um, from reputation support operational to search, and ser with search we, we kind of mean um, Obviously, a lot of marketing dollars go to Google today. Um, that might still be the case, because Google is obviously big, uh, bigly investing in AI as well. But there will be some shifts in how people are promoting their businesses and, and where those marketing dollars go. All of that will, will amount to about $8 billion in value being created by AI. The interesting part is when we start dreaming big. And that's obviously a lot of blue sky thinking. We don't exactly know what's going to happen. But what we were saying, what we were thinking, was what if everyone in the travel industry could be 1% more efficient? It's not about replacing jobs. It's about making everyone that works in the industry 1% more efficient. And 1% is very little, right? I mean, it's, it's a very conservative estimate. So think about your hotel check-in experience where someone doesn't need to type in your passport number, um, doesn't need to do all of these administrative things. Think about the events and sales team, that they can automatically generate um, contracts. Um, things like this, maintenance, uh, housekeeping, how they can be a little bit more efficient using some of these tools. Um, if we do that for the entire industry, it would be a 20 billion um, uh, value creation, and that's only 1%. Obviously, as you heard this morning, probably we could get easily to 5%, 10%. We do need to be a little bit clear-eyed about AI as well. Um, as I already said, there are certain areas 
where AI can have an impact. There's other areas where it obviously can't. And it shouldn't, right? The human element is very important in travel. Um, the human, the being together in a room is very important. Um, I personally didn't like the chatbot on the panel. To be fair, I'd rather listen to the humans than to the chatbot, right? Um, it's, it, there's definitely limitations. Other limitations are over-tourism, for example. Before the pandemic, we talked so much about um, overcrowding in destinations. AI isn't very good at alleviating this, because what AI does is it looks for the most common answers. So I asked the uh, chat GPT, where should I go for a weekend city break within Europe? And what it gives me back is this list, and I don't know if in the back if you can read it, it's Barcelona, Amsterdam, Prague, Lisbon, Copenhagen, Budapest. These are all very well-established cities for tourism, right? That's why it finds them. But they also are all cities that are dealing with over-tourism, overcrowding in, in certain areas, because it's too busy. So it's not very good at actually finding me destinations that um, are off the beaten track, or what, what people are looking for, or dispersing people better. A second area, a, a challenge, and, and I mentioned this already a little bit, is the poor data maturity in travel, in the travel industry, right? Um, how many hoteliers or um, um, other operators in the industry still work with pen and paper, with Excel? Um, like I said, uh, uh, what's very important about AI, the minimum requirement is that all the data is in the cloud. How many on-premise systems are still being used today? All of that data is useless for AI, right? And so travel is actually very bad when it comes to when you look at all the other industries that are on this slide, um, to data maturity. And so until we get to a stage where all data is shared in the cloud, is not siloed, um, and where we have airline data, hotel data, market data, everything accessible to AI, if we don't get to that stage, AI will be useless. So there are definitely still a lot of challenges and a lot of drawbacks. So it's not going to take over your life immediately. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the in-destination experience. Um, not about tech. Let's forget about tech. It's, uh, it's something that everyone talks about. Let's think about, okay, what, what is the actual in-destination experience? Um, uh, how is that going to change? And I want to talk about hybrid hospitality a little bit. So, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, how people work has completely changed. We did a recent survey with travelers in four countries, and the vast majority of people do some form of home or remote work today. Right? Um, this is impacting how people travel, because we asked that as well. We see that people that do work remote travel more often, short trips, as well as take longer trips. Um, and so, that's obviously a positive for the travel industry. We've talked about pleasure travel for a long time. Uh, we now call it blended travel. We no, not everyone liked the term pleasure, I guess, so we call it blended travel now. Um, and really, that's finally happening. We've talked about it for a long time, but it wasn't real. Now it is real. If you look at business travel on the left, trips that contain a weekend are, have increased dramatically. And on the other end, leisure travel, um, more and more people are taking their laptop with them when they're traveling for leisure, so they can work a few days and therefore extend their holidays. Now we're really blending business and leisure travel. And what does that mean? Hotels are doing a few things to really um, um, accommodate that and respond to that. And if you're not doing this or thinking about this and you're a hotelier, start thinking about it. First is um, looking at hotels more from a mixed-use point of view, right? Um, also from a sustainability point of view, it's very important that we don't have real estate sitting empty all day. Um, an office building is generally open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and actually some recent research by Density shows that of those hours, only two-thirds or around six hours are actually used um, with people in the office. A hotel, people normally check out at around 10 a.m., and the next guests will come around 4 p.m. In between, a lot of spaces are empty, not used. So why not combine those two 
um, uh, those, two use, to, those two use cases, right? Now, a lot of hotels have started doing that. There were some really early starters that, that looked at mixed use as a way to, to increase their revenue. Um, then Accor came with, uh, they, they purchased Voyo. Um, Crown Plaza had some, some interesting ideas. And now Hilton and Marriott, the big guns, are also going into this with day passes and things like that. So it's really become very much mainstream. Um, secondly, I want to talk a little bit about community. Um, I just had Selena on there, one of the brands that's really focusing on community as a, as a way of getting people together, having locals as well as long-staying guests as well as short-staying guests form this, this interesting community in the hotel um, that, that really helps um, sell the place. People are lonelier now than they've ever been. So this is very important. Um, loneliness and, and spend, time spent with family and friends is rapidly decreasing. This is in the US, but it's, it's pretty much everywhere in the world where this is the case. And so people are looking for hotels for something else. They're not just looking for a room, they're looking for a connection. And hotels are getting better at selling that, right? Not just by offering um, uh, ways of, of connecting in, in the lobby or things like that, but also through marketing. So this is an example of uh, Fairmont, um, not just talking about sort of the amenities that the hotel has, but also about feelings, talking about emotion, having an emotive response to staying in a specific hotel. That's becoming more and more important to consumers. Same uh, goes for, for online platforms. Airbnb is obviously a great example. Uh, Booking.com is probably uh, the, the opposite of what Airbnb would be and is, is the most um, um, hard and cold and harsh experience when it comes to booking. Um, Airbnb tries to be the opposite. They obviously started more as a, trying to be a community. And just last week, uh, their CEO talked to Skift, to us, and um, said that he wants the brand to be about people again. They launched Airbnb Rooms. Um, so really going back to what they used to be, which is actually staying in someone's house, in a room uh, in, in someone's house, and sharing that house with the owner, rather than only having properties that are all for the traveler themselves. Um, so Airbnb is trying to also uh, go back and play on this emotion that people are searching for some connectivity. Finally, I think um, when it comes to connectivity to community, um, it's, it's very important uh, from a sustainability point of view. Obviously, the environment is very important as well. Uh, and so people are looking for hotels to become more ethical businesses. Um, this very clearly shows that people want to see sustainable travel options. They say they're willing to pay for it. They're not always willing to pay for it, as you can see here. Um, only 1% actually paid uh, to offset a flight when they were asked to do so on Hopper. So there is definitely still a gap between what people say they want and what they're doing, but it's clear that this is coming. People want businesses to be more environmentally and socially responsible. At the moment, business travel is really the area where this is happening. Um, even though consumers say that they want it, they still have to pay for it themselves, so they, they don't tend to be um, as willing to do that. Whereas for business travel, this is much more important. Marriott says that one in seven of their corporate customers now wants to see sustainable credentials before they book with them. Um, it's not that much, but actually it's a $5.5 billion opportunity for Marriott, which obviously they don't want to leave on the table. And this will only grow. One caveat or, or one um, thought, final thought here is when we calculated what these hotel companies have as their targets when it comes to sustainability, um, and we, we compared that to 2019, where, which is sort of the last year that we had good data on how uh, travel companies were performing, we can see that all of these targets that are being set for 2030 reduction in emissions by these companies, we can see that a lot of these companies still need to um, reduce their emissions by 70 to, well, 50 to 70 percent. So there needs to be a massive, massive investment in this over the coming seven years six, seven years, um, and so we will likely see hotel companies having to start make some really tough decisions on who do we work with, 
who do we accept as our customers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And where do we open hotels? Maybe we should not open hotels. Um, do we acquire a certain company? Yes or no? Because this is what is going on, um, and this is where things are happening. So I started by saying that we think that this year, 2023, is the most creative year for travel. Um, you have to be creative. And I explained that by talking about how um, the distribution of travel is changing. I talked about how the booking experience is changing, and I talked about the in-destination experience and how that is changing. And so I just want to leave you um, with the final question here, which is, are you ready to be creative? And look at these, all of these challenges, I suppose, that are out there as opportunities, and think about and go back to your boardrooms and think about how can we adapt to these changes in the travel industry. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.